There's this boy I sent to the electric chair at Huntsville here a while back. My arrest and my testimony. He killed a 14-year-old girl. Papers said it was a crime of passion, but he told me there wasn't any passion to it. Told me that he'd been planning to kill somebody for about as long as he could remember. Said if they turned him out, he'd do it again. Said he knew he was going to hell. Be there in about 15 minutes. I don't know what to make of that. I surely don't. The crime you see now, it's hard to even take its measure. It's not that I'm afraid of it. I always knew you had to be willing to die to even do this job. But I don't want to push my chips forward and go out and meet something I don't understand. man would have to put his soul at hazard. He'd have to say, okay. I'll be part of this world. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Granite Mountain Movie Club. Um, we are here today with a very special movie and uh, a first-time guest who, you know, I'll say is a very special guest. Um, so today we're going to be talking about no Country for Old Men. And this was a movie I was a little hesitant to to cover on the podcast, partly because it's been done, you know, so what what more can be said about it, you know? Um, but I figured if I could get a uh you know, an A team of people in here, then then it'd be then it'd be safe to do it. So uh we got Lomez here. Uh, I'll let you go first, Lomez. Um everyone everyone probably listening knows your work from the uh the Passage Prize, the Passage Press, uh, and some of your writings uh, in in you know political magazines and stuff. So, I'll give you a second just to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks uh, for inviting me on. I'm 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 glad to be here. Um, I kind of echo your uh, sentiment here about covering No Country for Old Men, not necessarily because it's been done so many times, but it's such a powerful movie, and uh, there's so much you could potentially say about it, and uh, you know, when you approach something this big and this good, this sort of artistically sophistic, uh, something that's this artistically sort of sophisticated, it can be intimidating and uh, you almost don't want to touch it with any kind of analysis. Um, it's more just for, for my sake anyway, something to appreciate rather than critique or analyze. And so that's going to be sort of my approach to it. Yeah. And and let me know, am I, am I correct in kind of assuming, I mean, you work on the Passage Prize and stuff. And so I, I kind of see you as a, a literary type of guy. So I assume that you, that you read a lot and that you've maybe read the book for yeah. No Country. Yeah. I mean, books are my uh, first love and um, Cormac McCarthy is right up there in my sort of personal pantheon of great authors, certainly modern authors. I came to No Country sort of late, actually after I watched the movie, which is unusual. Um I tend to like uh, reading books before I go to the movie, if it's especially something of this magnitude, especially with a Cormac McCarthy. But um, the Coen brothers are just such good directors that uh, I, I happen to watch the movie in this case first. But yeah, I, I, I guess I'll say I tend to uh, sort of approach art storytelling narrative from a literary perspective rather than a film perspective. That's my uh, literature is my first love. It's what I understand best. I sort of understand the mechanics of literary storytelling and th that form, um, best I think. And so, um, in this case though, the movie is just so powerful that, and I think actually, you know, I'm going off a bit of a tangent here, uh, feel no, free fine. to jump at any time, but the book is particularly cinematic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and for Cormac McCarthy in particular, you almost get the sense that he wrote this book almost as a, you know, it almost reads like a screenplay. Um, so I think, um, I think he did. And he initially, he initially drafted it that way. And then I think the reason that you saw the movie first is because there was very little daylight between the book and the movie mm. because the Coen brothers had got it very early. Um, and he, he kind of always intended it, or I think anticipated that it would be a movie. So 
Um, so there was really like well, maybe a year or a year and a half or something between the release of the book and the movie. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually, now that you say that. And I know Cormac McCarthy had kind of, uh, you know, played around with the idea of writing um, screenplays for a while. And then, you know, we can get into this, too. In some respects, there is some similarities here between this book and its themes in The Counselor, um, mm. which was a movie. I, I can't remember exactly when it came out, but that was Cormac's first attempt to write a full screenplay. And that movie is kind of a mess in many ways, but also brilliant. I love that movie, actually. Um, yeah, but, I'm a counselor defender. As yeah, well. dude, the counselor is great. Uh, and the character, the lawyer, the the titular counselor, the lawyer character, um, has many of the same qualities and finds himself in, in a very similar predicament as uh, Llewellyn Moss in this book. And they've their failures as as like men, as people. This. Uh, it's, it's a kind of greed or getting in over their head against forces that they don't understand um, leads them to a similar fate. And so I, you almost get the sense that uh, No Country for Old Men, he was kind of nudging himself as a writer towards ultimately writing The Counselor. But I'm very glad that the Coen brothers took this over and, and ultimately made it into a movie because they did a much, much better job with it, I think, than probably Cormac ever could, including with their screenplay. Yeah. Um, and then just real quick, I've also got, um, you know, regulars to the show. We got uh, degree studies. I'll let you say hi. Uh, hey there, everyone. Yeah, I'll just mention up top. Uh, this is probably a, a top five movie for me all time. I agree with everything Loma said. I think it's it's unbelievable. So we'll we'll get into it. But thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, and then uh, and fan favorite. We've got Cool Fraser here. All the fans have been asking for me. And that's because <laughs> I'm cool and I'm listening. <laughs> he, he is cool. He is listening. Um, all right. So uh, No Country for Old Men. It comes out November 2007. Um, kind of a famous year for movies. You also had uh, There Will Be Blood. Um, i trying to remember what else came out that year. But there was it was one of the last times there was truly a great year. There's been a couple, but but not many. Um, it, uh, it did actually pretty well financially, um, cost about 25 million to make, and it made almost 200 million, uh, which is maybe a little bit, of, a bit of a surprise for, um, you know, just the way the movie ends and the themes and stuff. Uh, but it just speaks to the power of it that, you know, nor, nor even normies were interested in checking it out. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's universally acclaimed, you know, everyone, uh, everyone sort of just acknowledges that this is essentially one of the great movies of the last, uh, you know, 25 or 30 years. And it's really, it won the Oscar for, for best picture. And to me, that's the last, I looked through the list of, of, uh, Oscar best picture winners. It's the last time the actual best picture in a given year won the award. Um, I don't, I can't think of any other instance since then. I don't know if you guys have any that you particularly liked that actually won, but I can't, I couldn't think of any. Well, you know, uh, as a, as a pseudo fan of bestiality, I'd give a shout out to uh, the shape of water, but you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that a confession? Um, no, no, no. I, I, that just popped into my head. Cause I think that's one of the most ludicrous ones, but I, I can't really remember <laughs> what, what the others are. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's not great. So you, you don't need to, you don't even need to check, but <clears throat> with the Oscars kind of, kind of flopping and, and dropping the ball on picking good art. It w I really wish there was some other organization that would pick out good art and artistic work. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lomez, do you know of any organizations that are curating good art? <laughs> We're working on it, man. We haven't gotten into film yet, but, uh, actually, you know, this is an interesting question is like, how important is it to have awards and uh, what is the value of, of that kind of uh, apparatus, you know, uh, handing out uh, best pictures or, you know, uh, national book award Pulitzer, that kind of thing, I guess, fairly important. We should probably move in that direction, but we don't need to get uh, sidetracked on that conversation right now. Well, I'll put the, I'll put all the links, you know, in the description, everyone check out the passage prize, check out passage press buy buy whatever Lomez is selling, go buy it. And, uh, thank you. You know, well, we're trying well, to, we're trying honestly, to make a culture here. Yeah. 
Yeah, honestly, like I was looking at the guest list and and we've talked about it a lot on this podcast of kind of like, you know, we kind of talk about like, oh, what is right wing art versus left wing art or yeah. is art right wing or or whatever. And, and kind of those questions and like what makes good art and why does it always appear that like conservatives don't court good art or whatever. And um I don't know if No Country for Old Men is particularly conservative in its messaging or anything, but um, I think it is. But yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This is kind of like the crew to have the discussion about like art in general as well. So like, maybe we don't go into it too deep on this podcast, but like, I mean, I, I am kind of interested in 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 the discussion because because yeah, anyway. yeah. As far as I'm concerned, No Country is actually maybe the perfect example of quote unquote right wing art um, in that it's themes and messages uh, are sort of inescapably inescapably lead towards sort of quote unquote right wing conclusions um, and demonstrate the folly of a kind of wig history version of uh of progress and this like just constant forward march that, that all that, that doesn't always like sort of improve people's circumstances. Um, but without, without sort of putting its political message on its sleeve. And in fact, it may not even be the intent of the artists. And in the case of the Coen brothers or Cormac McCarthy, I doubt that it is quite so explicit, but they're operating from, uh, a sort of deeper premise, something that precedes ideology per se, and certainly precedes sort of uh, the the monkey politics of you know electoral voting. Um, they're reaching into deeper stuff that uh, that is true, that looks unflinchingly at the world, and it's kind of and it's ugliness and difficulties and complexity. And if you look truly at the world in the way that these artists do, um, the conclusions are again, inescapably and inevitably right wing. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I I would, I would just jump in and say, I agree with that fully. And I think one, one bizarre thing we have coming up in, in culture again and again, is that like, sort of certified libtard artists who are good often hit their highest highs with reactionary material. Yeah. And uh, I think the Coen brothers are certainly an instance of that. And I think one of the ways that's sort of interesting, we can talk about it, but one of the ways you can get away with that is that like what counts for subversion is so surface level and stupid that I, I think, you know, I think I even read criticism of this that would not that would say it was left, but that these were like, you know, that no country for old men has subversion of hero themes because yeah, the right. heroes are sort of outwitted and outpaced. So you can see how if you're if you're only engaging on that uh, very surface level, you can say, OK, well, there are these two classic masculine heroes in Llewellyn and the sheriff, and both of them sort of are uh, stymied or, or outmaneuvered by evil forces. Um, but, yeah, I think it's like. It's almost I was I, I told you, granted, I was rewatching parts of it today and there's just there's so much amazing stuff that uh, I was just thinking about it in in reference to, to Spengler. You know, when um, when uh, the sheriff goes to see his brother and he's talking about how he feels outmatched and uh, his brother tells the story of, of their great uncle or something getting killed by Indians. Yeah. Uh, and he just said, like, uh, what's coming has been coming before you and like mm-hmm. it'll keep uh, it'll keep moving forward after you. Like, don't be so vain as to think, you know, you were going to be the thing that stood in the way of sort of negative progress. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that like negative or pessimistic trajectory of history and culture, which I think is is one of the big themes of this movie. Like, I yeah. think that's incredibly reactionary. I know, uh, you know, some critics definitely took it upon themselves to paint it as as other than that. But that that's certainly my reaction to it. Yeah, they and and I wanted to get into get just broad strokes what what you guys like thought it was, you know, kind of a dumb question, but what is it about? And to me it's and and you were hitting on it just there like there's there's forces, there's things that are coming 
and that's and that to me is how kind of it fits in as as potentially like a uh maybe a, a right wing resource or something because the the main emphasis to me the main thing it's about is just that there is something that is always coming um and i, I was curious and that and that it is strong and it is powerful and that it matters and that if you want to do something about it you have to also be strong and ready and you know it's it seems like though that it's that it's not always just one thing and i was wondering though if you know a couple that i was kind of leaning into is uh you know is is it just human nature is that just what they're talking about just that human nature is always going to be um is always going to need to be kept in check or is it the corrupting power of money or you know they talk quite a bit about drugs you know the the way that drugs had changed their their landscape um or is it you know is it the border is it globalization or is it just the kind of the generic evil that that has always existed i think it's all of those things i mean uh, cormac mccarthy in general has this very kind of naturalistic sort of approach to his philosophy and i you know i don't want to start off by getting too deep into his philosophy here or anything like that but uh you know it's in in fact there's a line where he's talking, where uh, Ed Tom is talking to um, the other sheriff from one of the other counties, yeah, and he says it's not the one thing, you know. He he literally, you know, that's that's like this. It's uh, the dismal tide. It's the dismal <laughs> yeah. tide. Yeah, it's not the one thing, and that's the conclusion they reach. It's just this collection of forces. It's this collective sort of natural entropy that is pitted against uh, civilizational order. And this tenuous um, and very precarious hold that we ever have on order and the massive amount of effort it requires to maintain that order. And the moment you let slip in these entropic forces and the, you know, example that, uh, that Ed Tom gives is, you know, when, when people stop saying, sir and ma'am, um, mm-hmm. it's already too late, you know, something to that effect. I can't remember the exact line, but you know, once they stop saying sir and madam or sir and ma'am, um, we've already gone too far. And it's just this idea, I think that, uh, you know, we're, what we're up against is entropy is disorder is chaos and holding it together requires a whole complex of effort um, that put under too much strain is ultimately, regardless how how good the people are, regardless how ethical and morally just you know that the people in charge are, the authorities are, uh, that kind of order is just ultimately going to slip away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think my answer to what is it about is it's. It's about how to be a man and sort of the the pitfalls that can come with with even the the personality types that make a good man. And I think Llewellyn is very sure of himself. He doesn't have a lot of self doubt, but his his pride is sort of related to his his downfall. And then the sheriff is maybe a, an or, older version of Llewellyn, also a, a competent and sort of virtuous uh, man, but he's been around long enough that he's lost his pride. And I think the question he's asking that Llewellyn sort of didn't have time to ask is like, if you're a virtuous, competent man, but that doesn't enable you uh, to sort of stem the the tide of evil, the tide of entropy, what what does that mean at the end? And I think that the the sheriff doesn't have an answer to that question, but I think the, the speech at the end about the dream mm-hmm. where, you know, his father was preparing the fire for him. I, I think that's meant to say like he's contemplating like, I mean, not to get too, too lame with the metaphor, but like you just have to carry the flame and mm-hmm. like fathers doing that for sons is in fact meaningful. And that's why he remembers his father in that way. So, you know, even if he feels overwhelmed or like he didn't stem the tide, you know, maybe he's preparing the campsite for, for someone next. Yeah. And fire is like the perfect metaphor here for, you know, controlling these potentially chaotic forces and the great care required not only to keep the fire burning, but to keep it contained. And the idea that, you know, the father, quote unquote, is up ahead 
making that fire is a kind of hopeful message, actually. And what is otherwise maybe read as a kind of pessimistic film, this idea that there is somewhere to go to kind of continue on this path where that fire can be lit and controlled um, toward what ultimate destination, you know, all of us kind of may wonder about that. But yeah, that's how I read that ending too. Yeah. I, one interesting thing, and sorry, uh, cool Fraser. I, I don't know if we've been cutting you off or you lost connection, but um, in regards to those I dreams, I, I thought it interesting how he, he says at one point that, you know, he's, he says, I expected at some point that God would come into my life. Like as I became an old man, God would enter my life and, and he didn't, but, um, but he also is having dreams of a kind of biblical nature. And, uh, and I thought that was funny too, because when he starts into the dream, his wife sort of, she gives an indication that she's kind of tired of listening to, to his dream. So it, it implies that like, these aren't the first dreams he's had in you know, lately or in his life. He's maybe prone to these, to, he's a dreamer of dreams, I guess. Uh, that's, that was my, that's kind of my assumption, but, um, I just I thought that was interesting that he he hadn't thought that God had come into his life, but it it sounded like through his dreams God had come into his life. Yo, I'll just uh, quickly here one thing that struck me reading the book: this element of like God being absent from his life and his sort of search for it uh, is much more sort of uh, emphasized in the book. And mm-hmm. at the end, his wife is reading from the Book of Revelations. And it's at that point that he at so it's in the book it's him who asks his wife if there's any anybody in there in Revelations that is with green hair and bones in their noses which is something that's brought up you know previously in that conversation with yeah. the other sheriff and there's another instance where he's having a conversation and he asks uh, I can't remember who the character is he's talking to maybe the another prosecutor or something um, whether he's familiar with Mammon. And who Mammon is, and he keeps asking. So he's, you know, he's on this kind of spiritual search in the book. That's like way more emphasized. And the absence of God here, this kind of Nietzschean post-God world, is something that he's struggling within and trying to sort of discover. And again, I, you know, this is very uh, consistent in a lot of Cormac's work. Yeah, and I think a, a theme in a lot of crime film and crime literature is that like, and this isn't in the text of the film, but I I just sort of inferred it from the the archetype of the character is that like the man who stands up to face evil sometimes does that at the cost of his faith Mm -hmm. because the things they see make it difficult for them to believe, you know, there is ultimate order in the universe. And again, I don't think that's explicitly stated by the sheriff, but that's sort of the read I got on his character that like the life he lived and the exposure to violence was part of what was, you know, the blockage between, between him and God. Mm. Um, sorry, I just want to double check. Cool. Fraser, you, you are here, correct? I'm, I'm here. I'm oh, okay. just listening. I'm absorbed. I just want to make sure we didn't cut you off. Are you, yeah. no, you connection? as you all may know, I am like the resident expert on no country for all, for old men. In fact, I saw it the first time uh, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, in uh, November 2007 I was on a plane down to Paraguay and uh, so I did never saw it and I always wanted to but um, I like I, I actually was raised on Coen Brothers films my parents mm-hmm. were big fans so like I watched Raising Arizona like on VHS every day growing up <laughs> but uh, which there's some shared themes in that film as well I'm curious as because you're you've you've seen a lot, a lot of movies you're kind of a movie guy um, I'm curious what it's like to experience this movie for the first time at this point in your like adulthood. Like I, I'm going to, I want to hear about that. Yeah, it's good. I do think, I do think, and I was thinking this, um, some of what it does in uh, kind of, you know, there's, there's some deconstructing deconstruction of the narrative. Right. And I, I was actually curious how much of that is in the book. And I know some of it is, but I, I wonder where, where essentially like, the movie is set up at the beginning to have like these three men on this like collision course to meet each other. Right. Mm. And then at the time where they're all going to collide, they actually just skip it. Right. Yeah. And they don't, and they don't collide. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, they skip it and they don't collide. And so there, there's almost like a deconstruction of narrative itself or, you know, whatever. And and I think more movies since then have like tried stuff like that, like being a little bit subversive of kind of traditional narrative devices and things like that. So to a certain extent, like I wasn't as amazed by it, but I do think like this probably at least showed that that kind of that type of subversion could be commercial in a way, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting. The, the movie, I mean, the book is more focused on uh, the sheriff on Tommy Lee Jones character. It's less right. a kind of equal sort of share of the lead between these three sort of almost archetypal characters who, yeah, you're right. They, it, it sets you up for this uh, like intersection of their storylines and this collision course and uh, throws you off a bit. The movie does. I wonder actually this kind of, uh, you know, it does that with um, not just that they don't meet, but like Llewellyn's death, it just kind of happens off screen in this very right. um, anticlimactic way. And almost it, it, it is kind of dissatisfying or as a movie goer, I remember being, it was very jarring. I was like upset, you know, I kind of, kind of remember being there in the, movie theater, almost feeling this sense of being upset. And uh, I also want to ask, I'm wondering what people's feelings are about the ending. You know, I remember first seeing it, you know, it ends with this dream that he's recalling and then there's just cut to black. And I remember immediately thinking like, oh God, Sopranos all over again. Uh, (laughs) And for the record, like I actually love that ending, the Sopranos ending. And I, I'm not, I was ambivalent about the ending when I first saw it on, in No Country. And then I, I, I was maybe on the second or third viewing, uh, you know, something was pulling me back and I was like, oh shit, this is, this is great. This like, it was just like this gut punch, you know, and it was, oh man, it just, uh, it floored me. And this movie has gotten better on each subsequent watch. And, and so anyway, I'm curious what people thought about that ending. Yeah, I, I saw it in the theater and I remember actually being confused when they yeah. show Llewellyn's body because you only see yeah. like the lower half of Josh Brolin's face. And I sort of immediately was like, well, we're going to get a flashback or something like they can't uh-huh. do this and, and being really mad. And there's a number of things I didn't pick up on. One thing that I think is, is really uh, interesting that I noticed this time is that they sort of set up and I've heard that in the book, there's more like psychological development of Anton Chigur, but it's, it's very interesting in the movie that like, I think at the end, Anton Chigur's like faith in fate gets a little subverted because he, he tells Woody Harrelson, like, I don't need you to get the money. The money's going to come to me. Mm -hmm. Like meaning that he's very confident that when he threatens Llewellyn's wife, Llewellyn will just bring the money. But then, Llewellyn doesn't do that. And Llewellyn ends up getting killed by the Mexicans separately because they just, they got the info from, from grandma, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And then shortly after that in the movie, he gets in this sort of seemingly very random car accident. Um, And so it's just sort of back to back, like, uh, you know, unpredictability, like interfering with Shigura's plans. And I, I definitely didn't notice that the first time, but, I, I wondered if that was sort of supposed to be that, like, also his little weird psychopathic way of understanding the world is failing him in in these sort of smaller ways. And I was mm. curious if that was present in the book. I I was certainly um, when I saw I I did not have the the privilege of seeing it in the theater. I, I came to it late. I saw it later, like on DVD or something, and I was confused by some narrative points throughout it, especially yeah, uh, Llewellyn's demise. But then, but uh, Lomez, your question about the the end and the cut to black, um, that part always worked for me. That um, I th- the final his final like monologue, uh, I just thought was was beautiful. The, even the first time I saw it, I kind mm-hmm. of I could tell I was watching something special, and it and it just worked for me when they cut off. And you know, my my family's not um, you know they're not from like West Texas or anything, but but I would say temperamentally, there's a lot of similarity to many of the men in my family to maybe the way that uh, to Ed Tom, the way he kind of holds himself. And those are some of the kind of uh, stories that I would have been told growing up, like about, about like dreams or about, uh, you know, these, those sort of special uh, experiences. So that, that really resonated with me. 
Yeah, and the last scene is so well acted. Like, I think he's sort of been not that, like, he's been upset but not vulnerable for basically the whole movie. And then uh, it's, like, very subtle, but compared to the, the previous performance, there's sort of like a, a tide of, of previously unseen emotions while yeah. he's given that monologue, and it's really affecting. He, he said it was one take as well. Incredible. I mean, what's in, what's fascinating to me is it's it's line for line, the final sequence of the book too. Uh, there's no embellishment. There's no improvisation. The Coen Brothers have not touched that at all. Um, and so, yeah, it's 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 incredibly well delivered. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's just it's it's very good. You know, one thing it it it's, it stands in juxtaposition to. A previous scene we see him in with his cousin or or uncle or whoever it's it is. Uncle Uncle Ellis, yeah. Yeah, uncle. uncle Ellis, sorry, yeah. And um and in that scene he's he's sort of uh expressing some amount of self pity and um which I find interesting and which his uncle reminds him, I think as as uh Degree mentioned earlier, um is a kind of is a kind of vanity. You yeah. know, his, this almost like uh, belief that he had that he could do something himself to sort of bring about a pause to this drift of, you know, this, this entropic drift that his, this place is experiencing. And um, that self pity is then uh, erased a bit in that final scene with, with his wife and, and his recollection of that dream. He seems to have come to a, uh, a place of more sort of concrete understanding about his place in the world and his, you know, relative insignificance and sort of smallness in the face of all this sort of harshness and, um, and chaos, which is a, which is a kind of, which is, you know, weirdly that's like this optimistic turn that that that's what gives him comfort is, is to uh, recognize his own, to some degree, his own insignificance. Yeah, I think in the in the Uncle Ellis speech, I I recognize the admonition there as him sort of being like, "You mean you were good all this time because you thought you were going to win? Right. Like, yeah. Of course you're not going to win. You just you just have to be good." Uh-huh. And that that definitely speaks to my like that seems very Catholic to me. I mean, I'm sure it res- resonates with your guys' uh, religious traditions as well. But I think there's the the C.S. Lewis quote or some famous. Uh, person in the in the context of Catholicism said, you know, I'm a Catholic, so I expect history to be one long defeat. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's sort of what what Ellis is talking about and a theme of the movie. Yeah. Or that ethics that that practicing good ethics and being a moral person is strictly like a utilitarian calculation that, that you're good because it like produces some good result on your behalf or something, which is um, which this movie kind of. Uh, you know, just kind of stomps all over and suffocates that idea. Yeah. Um, there was, so we were talking about the dream for a bit. It's, there's something funny about that scene that I noticed, you know, I've seen this probably 10 times and something I just noticed in my recent watch was there's, there's two dreams. And mm-hmm. I, I always <laughs> just think about the second one because it's the one that it's longer and the movie ends on it. But he has this short little one where he says, I think he says he saw his father in town yeah. And his father gave him money and he lost it. And, <laughs> yeah. and I thought, you know, that's a powerful dream too. Like, um, there's something going on there. I don't, I don't know if it was meant to say like, you know, the older generation tries to hand us, you know, wisdom or something. And we, we're just too, we can't take it or they try and do things for us, but we, it just doesn't quite work out or something. I don't know. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on that dream. Well, you know what I thought about that this time and only this time is that, Throughout the uh, movie, Tommy Lee Jones' deputy is kind of a dumbass, though Though he, he does pick up on some things at the crime scene. But the dynamic between him and uh, the sheriff is that, like, he's sort of figuring out obvious things and, and Tommy Lee Jones has to suffer him. And I was thinking, yeah. like, oh, they keep bringing up that he's been a sheriff for so long. And I was wondering, like, was he ever the dumbass deputy or he's always been this self-possessed, competent guy. And then Mm -hmm. 
that dream, like his his father giving him money and he lost it, is the only time in the film where his sort of like authority is inverted, where he's portrayed as needing the uh, you know the suffering of an older person who was wiser and more responsible than him. So not that it confirmed that yes, he was the young deputy in his youth, but it was like you know it was him him playing that young deputy at least for that moment and that that inversion was powerful for me just because it's it's hard to imagine that character as not in control not doing the right thing always i think also with that first dream too i mean if you want to do like the you know grad school like midwit tier uh sort of you know deconstruction of that read of that you know it's they're in town the construct of which is you know a representation of like the construct of civilization of sort of ordered society the exchange of money where money is this uh you know has this no inherent value it's purely this sort of a uh, method of material exchange which and so there's what what's being described in that first dream are the sort of dynamics and interactions of the quote unquote, like sort of social ordered world. And ultimately for Ed Tom, what, you know, in the, the way that what's interesting about it, you can tell through the acting and how it's described that he has no real emotional attachment to it. It's ultimately sort of frivolous and, and ultimately contingent. Um, whereas the second dream is in the wilderness. Okay. We're, we're back in a state of nature and the thing being exchanged or the, the symbol that is passed between them or the salient item there is the symbol of fire, which is not merely this sort of symbolic or representational value, but has this inherent value and is, you know, the wellspring of, of building and re, well, sort of rebuilding and ordering. And so that first sort of civilizational dream has come to an end. It's over. Uh, what matters is this next move towards heading into the quote unquote wilderness and ultimately the rebuilding, the return to the more sort of primal uh, elements of the human condition. Well, one interesting thing I think that I kind of, I, I, that occurred to me as you were talking about the, the first dream is that in the film, I, I think every other exchange of money in the film, maybe not every, but nearly every exchange of money uh, has like immediate conflict following it. Mm -hmm. um, like Shigur, Shigur gives those kids money and they fight over it. And uh, right. um, Llewellyn gives those boys on the bridge some money and, and they kind of a hassle them for more. And then, you know, there's just the actual central thing about the money that's being, you know, that people are chasing down. But in, but in the dream, there's money changing hands and there's no conflict. So I don't, I don't know if that's, that was significant. Like, uh, it was yeah. unimportant to him or something. I don't know. Yeah, he sort of has static with the, the cabbies, too. And then, interestingly, when he just hitchhikes, the guy is, like, totally gracious in his concern for him. You know, telling him he shouldn't hitchhike. And, and obviously, like, they're not exchanging money. <laughs> Well, in the yeah. coin, the representation of fate is the is the coin, you know. So um, there's something there with money, and you know, this is where like, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the libtard take on that would be this is anti-capitalist. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's so Don't superficial, you... though. I mean, of course, that's like such a lame. That's true. The guy who picked him up hitchhiking, that was crucial mutual aid. And if everyone <laughs> in the movie would have done that, you know. I'm sure if we look, there was think pieces about it in 2007. Or... Yeah, I can't really remember like what, obviously it won Best Picture, so it must have been lauded. But I, I can't remember, besides like a few obscure things I read, I can't remember what the sort of mainstream take was but maybe it was just focused on the the sort of excellent uh filmmaking which it you know it should be like it's one thing i wanted to mention too is just it's such a uh it's such a beautiful movie like yeah. when i did see it in theaters i remember being really blown away by the scene where he's just looking through his scope at the deer and yeah. then it gets away and then he's sort of like stalking through the prairie like 
I don't know. I don't know. Granted, if you know if there's anything special about how they film this or just, you know, I guess the Coen brothers always uh, plan their shots very exactingly. But I remember just the the visuals having a really big effect on me when I saw it. Yeah, I I actually found, so it was filmed by Roger Deakins, who's Mm -hmm. widely regarded as like the best or, or, you know, he's kind of, he does, he's done a bunch of the Coen's stuff. He does most of like, he's goaded with the sauce. Yeah. 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 Um, And he, um, I he has a podcast actually. And about a year ago, he did an episode on, on no country. And uh, the main thing is just that they, it just that they had him doing it and they were extreme. They were actually very economical in how they shot. Um, they shot like a quarter of what most movies, the most two hour movies would shoot. And yeah, I don't know. They just had a, a pro behind the lens and they were just very intentional about everything they did. I think so, so I heard it. I watched an interview with um, Tommy Lee Jones and apparently he insisted to the directors cause he was the first one signed on to the, the movie he insisted that they film it in West Texas. And mm. so I think that's also part of it is, is actually filming it in the place where it's supposed to be and kind of getting yeah, the beauty of that uh, area. They certainly didn't cut any corners on, on actually being in the place. What year is it supposed to take place? Cause the, everything looks great. Like the hotels and the 1980. Yeah. Okay. Which I, I'm actually I'm glad you brought up the year. Cause I wanted to mention, so I, I had a, I was wondering some, well, I proposed earlier, you know, what is this like? Uh, um, what is this ominous thing that's coming, right? And I and I was thinking about it, and uh, Ed Tom the Clintons. Is, well, <laughs> kind of, yeah. Ed yeah. Tom is how old is he? He's like he's like yeah. sixty, and it's nineteen eighty, so yeah. he's not a boomer. But who is a boomer? Uh, Llewellyn's a boomer. Shigur yeah. is probably a boomer. Carson Wells is a boomer. So it's like what's coming is the boomers. Like that is what was <laughs> going to be coming, uh, and that was going to shake everything into like a uh, unrecognizable uh, just re- rearrange the landscape and and Llewellyn is a veteran and one of the things I was thinking of when I was watching it is so it came out in like 2008 and I guess it was written in 2005 so I was I was thinking there's got to be some parallels between you know him being a Vietnam vet and being like so apt for violence and and good at it right mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then kind of coming home and and just being a loser living in a a trailer and and i was thinking of kind of the our g watt vets that we have um and and basically th- the same thing and it reminds me of the uh the onion article of the uh like this guy who would have been a um like one of the best warriors in the in two like four thousand years ago is instead selling mattresses <laughs> and and that's like who uh Llewellyn's character is he's like this this guy who's just so proficient and and ready for violence but he he's he's so far away from it but then kind of stumbles his way into it and kind of finds a passion for it again I guess and and but yeah I think there's there might be a correlation of like thinking about also our our vets nowadays coming home and and what what to do with them. But yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. The only caveat I have is I think it's like important to the text of the movie that his domestic life is pretty good. And mm-hmm. like his relationship with his wife is great because I think, yes, I think you have to you have to believe for the movie to make sense. Like he would not be fucked if he didn't go get this money. Like it's sort of his he's it's not like a terrible sinful decision but it's like his pride a little bit whereas mm-hmm. if they set it up as like there was nothing good in his life then the, right. the moral stakes of him going to get the money wouldn't be as as high cuz i, I well, think and, like and Josh Brolin said that for his own character development he he said that he was doing it for his wife which isn't explicitly mm-hmm. said in the movie but it it's kind of shown but but yeah, I and we always do talk about the wives in these films that on this podcast. So I we should probably hit on that too. I, I, I do, like her. Yeah, I want to say too, just from a storytelling perspective, how they establish the Coen Brothers and you know Cormac McCarthy here too, like Llewellyn's competency in this immediate mm-hmm. sense we have that this is a capable guy who is who is prepared for virtually any situation. Um, they could have done this like ham handed flashback to Vietnam thing where we see him doing some like, 
you know, war hero, uh, you know, antics or something. But it's done so subtly in this movie. And it's just through his pro like almost all of it is unspoken process of first just uh, hunting the antelope or the pronghorns or whatever it is. And then him getting down to that scene and like the way that he checks each of the cars and the weapons. And then when he's like approaching the guy, the, the, you know, ultimo hombre, the last man standing, how he sort of deduces where that guy will be. And then, you know, sort of pauses with his binoculars and waits to see if the guy will move and checks his watch. You know, it's all this really small, subtle sort of process work where uh, you just see this guy, you know, it's like anytime you see, I don't know, like you go get your car fixed from like a good mechanic and it's just some, the way that they kind of move around the car and their sort of comfort in that like domain in that experience is what gives you confidence. And, and this guy, it's just sort of amazing how the Coen brothers in that first scene, you know, those first like 20 minutes are able to accomplish that with, again, no dialogue, nobody else sort of vouching for his credibility. And in the hands of a lesser storyteller and lesser filmmakers, that's usually done so clumsily that it's sort of incredible how well they can do that. And it's not just Llewellyn, but all their characterization is done with just such subtle and sort of beautiful expert touch. Yeah, that first... um... 20 or 30 minutes uh, is, I mean, the, the whole thing to me is, is pretty much perfect, but, but that first 20 or 30 minutes, they, they accomplish a lot very, very efficiently. Uh, one thing on his, his military stuff and in, in the book, they, I think Ed Tom visits to uh, Llewellyn's dad, I think. Mm-hmm. And they tells him, he's like, Oh yeah, he was, he was like the best sniper in Vietnam. He was mm-hmm. awesome. And something like that. So we do learn a little bit more about his, like, his combat experience, but, but yeah, it's great. I think it's nice how they kept it out of the movie. They didn't have to tell you too much other than mm-hmm. when he's uh, talking to Carson Wells and, and they, they barely touch on it. Yeah. I like, I don't know why, but I find it so charming when he goes, it, Carson Wells is like, I was in the war too. And Lou Allen goes, that make me your buddy. Yeah, it's so and great. I was like, I don't, I don't even know why that's <laughs> so funny, but it really is. Yeah. It's so well, good. Uh, one of my favorite lines was uh, <laughs> the wife is like, Where'd you get that? And he's like, at the getting place. Yeah, the getting place. I so many good, lines. good lines in this. I feel like that's got to be Coen Brothers stuff, though. I don't know. No, no, that's in the book. Both those lines are verbatim in the okay. book. Yeah. Okay. That's also that. Well, the, I mean, the, the Coen Brothers always have these. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you, Cool Frazier, go. Oh, I was just going to say the the Coen Brothers always have these like funny side characters, which there's a lot in this movie. But there's, you know, they kind of always have these like rural shop owners or side uh-huh. characters in their movies that just have funny lines like the I, I'm thinking of the the guy who's trying to sell them, sell the the criminals balloons in Raising Arizona. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, did you guys like, see there was blow up into any funny shapes unless you think Brown was funny. <laughs> There was recently like a little Twitter moment about the fat woman who runs the trailer park who wasn't taking any of uh, Shiger's shit. Like people yeah. were just tweeting out her picture and being like, this is the most uh, like powerful opponent of modernity <laughs> or whatever that like Shiger just knew he had to like get away from. And there is something funny and true about that, that like she's so unpleasant that you can like see him in the scene just – being like, I got to get out of here. Like, I'm, I'm not weighing <laughs> all my normal, like, fate murder nonsense. <laughs> I, I, I wonder, I don't know if that was, I don't know if I you read too much into those things or something. And I, I wondered if that's like, are they saying something there? Like, you know, the only way to win is just not to play. It's just to be so, you know, so uh, resolute in, in your game that you don't enter anyone else's. Because, you know, the gas station guy kind of allows himself to get put in the game mm-hmm. uh, and, and other people do too. But this, but that lady at the, I think she, she works like at the, uh, the mobile home place, right? She, yeah. just, she just doesn't, yeah, she just doesn't play the game. And I was wondering if that was supposed to be like a, if they were saying something well, or just, yeah, the guy at the gas station and the first guy in the car that he kills are yeah. like, so cattle like mm-hmm. that. It's really striking. Like it was really striking to me this time 
uh, that he tells the guy, like the guy doesn't ask him like why he's not wearing a police uniform. And he says like, what's that to the cow killer thing? And he says, please step closer to me, sir. And the guy <laughs> just does. And there's a, there's a number of moments with the gas station guy where the gas station guy's like trying to get out of the conversation and Shigur just bullies him. And so, yeah, I did think there was something, I assume because of the rest of the themes of the movie that if it was saying like, you have to be antisocial at all times to protect yourself, that that would be sort of like a, not a, not a prescriptive recommendation, but like a sad observation about the state of the world. But it is a, a super dramatic contrast that that woman, that woman is the sort of only NPC who seems to have any capability uh, to have like any sense of danger or, or self-preservation. Yeah. Shakur seems to be offended at the gas station clerk for having lived the particular life that he's living, you know, having taken over that shop from his father-in-law marrying into it, you know, he kind of like swallows hard on the peanut or whatever. And I wonder if there's something to that, like, uh, this idea that squandering a life is somehow, um, you know, a violation of, of, you know, Shigura's code. Whereas that woman at the trailer park, she's sort of just purely of herself, you know, she's like this authentic uh, person, I guess. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Shigur is, Shigur is yeah. a high agency guru. Yeah. And when, he encounters, <laughs> when he encounters low agency people, they yeah, are going to die. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, the, I think one of the the- major themes of the movie is is fate and agency. Yes. Um, right. Cause if you, if you have a predetermined fate, do you have agency? Right. And so, and I mean, there's that, the famous line of between him and Woody Harrelson's character, like if the principle you follow brought you here, what, of what good is it? You know? Yeah. But, um, similarly, I think it is showing like, cause the, the, the gas station clerk is just like, you know, has made no choices in his life, has just ended up there almost against his will. And and so, yeah, Shigur is against that because he represents kind of fate in and of itself. But the lady who's able to say, no, I will not like and, and like takes some agency like he respects it for some reason. Yeah. And, yeah. and granted, I think there's something to answer your question about, like, is the answer to not play? I think there's something very powerful when. And I've never really fully understood the scene, but when his his wife is just saying, like, it's not the coin, it's you. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, admit that it's you. And I don't know if in it like it certainly seems in the film like he he kills her and leaves, but I think we we don't know whether she ever called it or he just got frustrated and, and killed her anyway. But I, I do think that's supposed to show I don't know if it's her like moral purity, but I think it's supposed to show something high value in her that she doesn't want to play. She wants to try and make Shigur uh, accept responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. And, and he's, he's the embodiment of fate in this, but then right after he leaves her house, that's when like, you realize even fate catches up with him where just a random happenstance of a, someone running a red light, could have ended his life. Uh, uh, Lomez, did I remember correctly? In the book, isn't it a car full of Mexicans? That but hit in the movie, him? It's just, like, it's just some white guy. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. Um, are, are we talking about the, the other right-wing the fans in this movie? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I honestly don't remember. Um, I'd have to go back and look. Some of these I things, you know, they're... stand out from the book. Others don't. Uh yeah, I was just curious because I just noticed on this watch, I'm like, oh, that just looks like a, some suburban white dad. But yeah, I, I, I had thought in the book that it was like a uh, a bunch of Mexican guys like going to work or something. Very well could have. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll, and then, I'll have to oh, look back. degree studies. I think uh, my understanding was that Carla Jean definitely dies. I don't remember what it said in the book, but yeah, definitely. And the the weird thing about that too is it's like he made a deal with Llewellyn and. Uh, I don't. I don't really know how this fits into his like his code or whatever because he he makes a deal about Carla Jean, but she's not in part of the deal. So I don't. I don't really know how how that fits in his code or if that just doesn't matter. But but yeah, it, I don't think anything she could say mattered because because it wasn't between him and her. 
Yeah, he said that the language in that scene is really interesting and perverse because he says, she's like, why do you have to do it? And he says, I gave my word. Yeah. I gave my word to your husband. And it's referencing the phone call in the hospital where he's like, if you come over with the money right now, you won't be spared, but your your wife will be. And Llewellyn is sort of like, well, I don't know why I'm supposed to be afraid of you. Maybe you should be afraid of me. And I think it's, yeah, it's definitely, um, it, it's a good scene because I think what she's expressing is like, the conflict is resolved. Like, why do you possibly care about this? Like, you know, my husband's dead. The money is, is I don't know if the, I guess the Mexicans got away with it. Um, but that was actually a question I want to ask, not to get on a tangent here, but I, I realized this time that I'm like a little bit confused by <laughs> what's actually taking place in the movie. Cause is, is Shigur trying to go renegade and get away with the money himself? Like yeah. to spite the people that followed him. And then they have other, you know, drug employees who end up getting it. So he sort of fails in that. Well, well he gets the money cause the, the, the Mexicans don't get it before the police come. And then Shigur breaks in the crime scene after and gets it out of the vent. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. Okay. And, and, and it doesn't, I think it shows him taking the money to whoever replaces the Steven root character who, who he killed. I see. I see. Um, and I think they make it a little more clear in the book, but yeah, there's a scene in the book where Shigur ends up in the office um, with the suitcase but in, yeah, go ahead. No, that was some. That was something I was confused about too. Is like who actually? Uh, I, I I'd watched it a couple times before. I'm like, wait a minute, who actually got the money? Like I didn't. It it did take a couple times for me to, to figure it out. And another one that <clears throat> when when I prepare for these these conversations, I'll usually listen to a handful of other people's podcasts or or like um as like video essays or whatever. And a lot of people seem to think that that. Uh, Anton is in the room when Ed Tom shows up at night in the, oh. at the motel. A lot of people well, they think they edited showing him back and forth. Yeah, they they, they 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 make it look like he's in there, but he's just in a different room, right? I think so. Yeah, that that was my read of it. Yeah, that's that's just one thing I was confused about. Yeah, and do you guys know why does he kill the two white guys that <sighs> take him to the scene originally? Uh, I don't know who those guys are or, or why he killed them, but I just assume they needed. Yeah, so some story killed. clarification. Here's here's my understanding of the actual story. Uh, you know, they the deal goes the deal goes bad. Um, Stephen Root's people, and he never gets a character name. He's just called like the man who hired mm -hmm. Wells or something. I think their organization contracted with Anton to get it back, but then they weren't happy with how he's doing it. So then they brought in Wells as well. Is that Right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, and then... So who were the two dudes? The yeah. only thing I could come up with is that they were part of uh, Stephen Root's organization, like bringing him to the scene, and that uh, Shigur was sort of pissed off that people had already done stuff. Like, he was like, who cut the tires? And they're like, we don't know, Mexicans. And so he maybe just thought, like, you guys don't have this under right. control or, like, you're dumbasses or something. But I didn't really understand it. Yeah, I don't know. They they leave a couple things vague. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't totally matter. I just, uh, I guess I will figure it out on subsequent watches. Speaking of uh, shooting a bunch of people, um, definitely <laughs> violence is the other uh, theme of this this movie, and it's it's in a lot of Coen Brothers movies where there's just kind of like extreme violence, and sometimes it's like incongruous with the rest of the movie mm -hmm. or the tone or the plot. Um, and I wonder like why they have a fascination of violence, but also I think partially maybe that's why some of the themes of, you know, no matter how libtarded the directors are, like, because they're interested in violence, like it kind of ends up on the other side. I don't know what you guys think about that. Well, yeah, then... that's interesting. I, I remember that, um, Blood Simple, one of their like earliest movies, I think, was the first. Yeah. Oh, it's their first. Okay, so, I think so. yeah. What's interesting is. about that movie is like a lot of the people, or at least the the central character doing violence in that movie, like is not a person practiced with violence, and so 
one of the themes sort of becomes like how difficult it is to actually kill someone. And then it's, it's interesting that in this movie, it's like, I mean, there are characters that are, that are hard to kill in this movie, but it's also like violence is sort of easy and casual for a lot of people. So it's like, they're definitely coming at it from, from two different sides there, but they were both uh, very, very compelling. I think in the case of this movie too, violence is a um, sort of symbolic of the, the natural sort of endpoint of this, this entropy um, that's kind of taken over. And it's important that Ed Tom tells us at the beginning uh, that, you know, of these different sheriffs who don't carry guns and uh, which I think is, is easy enough to sort of read as a, an attempt to kind of um, evade violence in a way, or that they've reached this state in which um, violence is rare and, and doesn't, or in any way, right. violence doesn't have to be used in order to instantiate order on these places. Like violence will, of course, still exist, but it's not a, but it's not in, in, a, in the case of these older towns, it's not a prerequisite for order. Whereas now in this movie, what we're seeing is the return of enough of this entropy and disorder that violence is now like sort of part and parcel to, uh, to what goes on there and is now a requirement. Ed Tom does have a gun when he enters the hotel room to sort of, you know, the, the sort of, it's almost like um, when he enters that hotel room and Shagur may or may not be there. It's kind of like Schrodinger's cat, like Schrodinger's like Anton Shagur where, right. You know, and, and given like the emphasis on fate and coin flipping, that's almost how it like reads to me when he opens that door. But, um, uh, yeah, that's how I read the violence in this. It's it's a return to a more natural, disordered state. Right. And like in modernity, we are kind of sanitized and removed from violence, whereas yeah. like there's violence happening in the Middle East, but we don't see it. Right. And uh, we have no sense of violence. And so a lot of people have this sense of safety because of it. But then now that society is disintegrating, violence is reentering. And like people have no preparation for it. So and and in this movie, nobody's prepared for Shigur. Like yeah. nobody is like has a response for a guy who's just going to kill you for no reason or at the. Yeah, and it's point. it's a it's it's kind of a goofy moment. But another one of my favorite uh, moments in the movie is when Ed Tom tells Llewellyn's wife about the guy who shot himself while trying to shoot a cow. Because <laughs> right. basically she, she had said like uh, Llewellyn can take all comers, meaning like when it comes to violence, uh, you know, he's as, as competent as yeah. anyone. And he tells this funny anecdote about a guy who he's trying to kill the cow and the original method doesn't work. So he tries to shoot the cow, but he misses because the cow's thrashing around and the bullet bounces around and hits him in the shoulder. And he says something yeah. like, what I'm saying is even when it comes to man versus steer, the outcome is not a sure thing. <laughs> so and he's good. like, yeah. And it's like, so he's basically saying like, you know, it's foolish to think you, you you know, what's going to happen just yeah. because you're, you're good at this. And it's like, it's, it's played off as if it's silly, but it's, it's very profound. Yeah. Well, another, another thing, um, one reason that, you know, the, that uh, Cohen, the Cohen adaptation of a, of a McCarthy book works so well is that, you know, violence is like, I don't know if it's, and maybe not qualified to really talk too much on McCarthy. I've only read a few books, but violence is sort of the cent feels like the central theme to a lot of what he does. Mm -hmm. And for him, there's something about the land, um, like, you know, no country. It's like the, just the American West, the Southwest and the borderlands specifically for him are just like, you know, places of violence that just, uh, I don't know, they're built with violence and they require violence. I don't know if, um, I don't know if you guys can speak to that. Yeah, that's definitely true of McCarthy and his work. and Well, in particular, his work that takes place in West Texas, which is sort of the latter half of his career. But th this theme is, you know, brought up again in that conversation with his uncle Ellis, where they talk right. about the country and the country being hard on people. And there's something about like the place in the, in the sort of literal and sort of metaphorical hardness of the soil in the yeah. harshness and indifference of it that invites violence and it's just sort of always an ever present thing there. Um, 
that's just a part of a part of this world and inescapable. You know, and I, I'm just thinking too on this conversation. What's ironic, sort of, about this conversation of violence and Ed Tom in particular, his uh, aversion to it, or you know, this idea that violence is some new thing. We have both of these characters who are veterans of these horrific, bloody wars. And we're certainly, you know, had front row seats to uh, violence that either they committed or were committed upon them or their or their comrades. So it's an interesting idea, but that's all off screen. You know, that's all this sort of unstated background. Yeah. And like it, there's kind of a message that violence is the state of nature or something. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I do have the, the right wing Twitter take associated with this as well, um, that that kid, the TikTok guy who is like breaking into people's houses. Mizzy. Yeah. Our boy Mizzy. Um, yeah, like I feel like he's like the TikTok Anton Chigurh because no, people no. don't have an answer for it. Like they he he goes and just does something you're not allowed to do, right? And nobody has an answer for it. Because in a polite society, you don't have an answer for um a fella of Mizzy's complexion uh walking into <laughs> your house. And just just coming in like he owns it, right? So cool, um, he just he just does the mad thing. Oh my <laughs> yeah. god! All right, so I don't, you know, this is my maybe this is my uh, sort of idiosyncratic read of this, but I think they're the exact opposite. Mizzy is an agent of pure disorder of what I call or what you know is called antinomianism. This is a this is a concept that Curtis Yarvin maybe popularized at some point, whereas Shigur. In, in a way that's sort of strange and, and again, it's sort of paradoxical, is an agent of order in his own okay. way. He's, he, he's the agent of fate, of predetermination. I mean, there's a lot of sort of, uh, one might say, malevolence and, and violence in that. But he's, he's operating in accordance with um, a kind of law that uh, precedes you know, it's he, he's almost like reluctant sometimes to do these things, but he has to because fate in some way, destiny and, and the sort of lives of these characters require that he does these things. And so I think I think um, Shigur, for whatever else he is or isn't, he's predictable. Like we, we know, in a sense, what he's doing and what he's after. He's operating yeah. according to a code, whereas like what Mizzy is doing is the is the total opposite. It's pure disorder and, and chaos. So that, that well, would be yeah, yeah. Mizzy, If Mizzy was <laughs> Anton Chigur, he would go up to white people and say, say the gamer word yeah, and yeah. I won't and I won't go into your house. But if you don't say the gamer word, I will go into your house. Mizzy should but, start carrying a quarter and you know doing coin tosses. <laughs> he should get a cow. That's a, yeah, a God. Metal rod. I guess thing. they don't have quarters, a, a pound coin or whatever. Yeah, pound coin is that what they call it? <laughs> I think that is what they, they that is what they call it. I've lived there. One, one quid, one quid, sir. I thought it's called a quid. Yeah. Well, that just means one pound coin, but yeah. I'll oh, get out of here. Um, <laughs> but beyond that, as well, just you know, other videos you see on right wing Twitter are just like random acts of violence being committed by people in yeah in what used to be a great country or whatever. And, well, yeah, uh, the real the real ultra right wing take is to feel wistful for the violence of Anton Shakur in yeah. 2023 because of uh, it makes me feel wistful. That's what I said when I finished this movie. <laughs> yeah, but sorry, cool, Fraser. I interrupted. Oh, you. I was ju I was just gonna say that um, like there's that horrible video of like some lady with a knife just went up and like stabbed some kids as they were walking oh down God. the street. Like the parents were walking with them. Oh yeah, this lady just that. like slices the kids, and like the the dad has like no response for it, and like so like the violence in this movie is is it kind of reminded me of those real life acts of violence where just like people in this modern society kind of have these expectations and they have no answer for kind of the reality of the world, which is kind of there's violence and anyone could kill you at any point for any reason, you know? Yeah. Um, Frazier, mm -hmm. do you have, uh, do you have any takes on the, the guns and the gun work in this movie? Oh yeah. I did research on the guns. I'm apparently the gun expert here, even though well, you know I, more than me about guns. 
If the, well, so I looked eight, it up. There's there's a video from the prop master. Um, and was it the same one, same one from that uh, Alec Baldwin movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same same guy. No, no, just kidding. They probably had the best one. Yeah. So so apparently the Coens just said we want a silenced automatic shotgun. And apparently they didn't even that didn't even exist. And so there they looked it up and there was one silenced pump action shotgun. And uh, and so there wasn't an automatic one. So they just created it. And um, and so they tried to make it look like it was homemade by Shigur. Uh, so it doesn't actually exist. And also suppressors and silencers don't actually make things that quiet. So. Yeah, but the sound is very cool. Yeah. Good sound like design. Great sound design. Yeah. The only thing that I didn't understand, and I'm I'm not a gun expert either, but when when Llewellyn is driving the car, it's like uh they're sort of it looks like there's single shots piercing the windshield. Whereas like uh-huh. wouldn't it be some kind of spread from a shotgun? Uh, it could be that he's shooting slugs, which would be a single okay. shot. Yeah. But yeah, it's oh. all very like whether there's any verisimilitude to it or not. It at least it all seems very cool. Uh, like yes, the one thing that I think confused me the first time is that when he has the silenced shotgun at his side, it can resemble the cow killing thing. Mm-hmm. And so, like a couple times, I, I like confused one for the other. I didn't know if they they wanted his weapons to have sort of a consistent uh, like heft or look, but. Um, they both are pretty cool. My my question is, why wouldn't people from West Texas know what a cow killing thing looks like? You'd think they would. You know, like the detective or the 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 people are like, he had some kind of air tank. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing, and it's like you can't put that together. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I think it. I, I think know. it confuses uh, Ed Tom at one point too. They're trying to like right because they figure out where the, the bullet entry. Yeah, 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 and they can't figure it out. You would think they might know. Um, yeah. Okay, I wanted to. Uh, I mean, we've talked quite a bit about like the themes and stuff, and from here, if if unless anyone has anything else to say about like the themes or you know symbolism or something, here I'll, I'll just get... read my my theme notes. I have foreigners <laughs> are bad. Um, uh, nostalgia build the wall yeah uh ed tom kind of has nostalgia and how you know we're obsessed with nostalgia now yeah um and then yeah that's it i guess i guess i had another theme not a theme so much but just kind of a a thing but as i watched it i kind of played with the idea of sugar being not even a not even a real person, you know, a super, more of a supernatural meta, metaphysical sort of being. But uh-huh. I mean, he's he's in the movie. He's a real thing in the movie. But I was I was c- trying for a while to make the case that, like, in my mind, that okay, maybe he's maybe no one ever really meets him because he's not actually real. But I I, I couldn't really make the case for that. Well, uh, they have this that same character where like people are like, is he even real? Uh, with the bounty hunter in um, Raising Arizona, mm. who's kind yeah, of like yeah, the, Leonard Smalls. The, yeah. yeah, Leonard Smalls is the the counterpoint to Nicolas Cage's character and H.I. He's McDonough. just a symbol more so. But than yeah, he, yeah, more so, And they, they kind of say multiple times, like, did he even exist? Was he real? Like, and yeah. I mean, and Ed Tom says that about Shigur. He says, you know, I'm, is, I wonder if he's a ghost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And but, supposedly, uh, I heard in the book, they don't ever physically describe him. They don't His really. eyes are described, I believe. Right. They only he's, describe he's got the eyes. blue eyes, which is what I remember. But that's about mm-hmm. it. Which he doesn't, yeah, of Co- course, in the movie. And the Coens just gave him that haircut because they they saw it in a in a picture from the seventies and thought it was oh, really? yeah. cool or something. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I I've, I've always been fascinated by the the aesthetics of the Shigur character and like like such strong choices that somehow work, but I have mm-hmm. no inclination of why or, or why they were chosen, <laughs> yeah. but it, it works. Yeah. I mean, the, the hair is like child molester hair and it, it seems like it would stick out. And so if you guy who kind of wants to be invisible, it's a little unusual, but that also fits in with the foreigners are bad theme. Cause he's got like a weird <laughs> European haircut or something. <laughs> 
Yeah, presumably he's like, uh, you know, is he Mexican? They don't really say. Like he's no, no they he's don't purposefully say. his his heritage, his ethnicity um, is purposefully obscured. And I remember somewhere hearing that uh, McCarthy had picked the name Shagur precisely because it it was like illegible ethnically. Mm. Yeah, it could be like Dutch or you know maybe Spanish, maybe French. Yeah, who knows? That's another part that makes me laugh is when Brolin Llewellyn is kind of trying to puff up his chest and ask, not scared, and he's like, "His name's Sugar." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk about some more like production-based things. Uh, the casting. I mean, the casting, as far as I'm concerned, is basically perfect. But mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys had any any areas where you thought they could have swapped someone or something. I thought the uh Llewellyn's wife's mother was like a bit of a caricature in a way that other characters mm. in the movie aren't but it was still good yeah it's the casting across the board is is great and it makes sense what you said that uh they didn't have to like do a lot of takes or extend a lot of film because like everyone involved is is such a pro that it's it's sort of easy to yeah to believe that but yeah I think it's it's perfect or I have in my perfect. in my notes says Carla Jean's mom is maybe a little much but some old ladies do be like that <laughs> yeah yeah that's perfect um supposedly Brolin uh, recorded his audition tape on the set of uh, what was the Quentin Grindhouse. Tarantino Grindhouse and oh, so yeah Quentin Tarantino nice. directed his audition tape nice. And then and they used professional gear, and so when the the Coens got it, famously their first response was, "Who lit this?" <laughs> they didn't want Brolin though. Um, he was not their first choice. The first choice was Heath Ledger. Oh wow! They were like, "Who lit this?" And why is it focused on Brolin's feet? That makes sense. <laughs> Ledger makes the, sense. The Coens said they were looking for a good, clean boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ledger said no, so he could do drugs. Didn't he yeah. just die too? Or no? I guess there's a. Well, he was alive there's, at this yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. But was he, this he just post, decided to um, die instead? Was this this is post obviously Brokeback Mountain? So um, yeah, yeah, I think so. yeah, which would have been that sort of actually that surprises me because have, this role of Jake like Gyllenhaal this kind back of, at home. Yeah, you know, if if I would have seen Heath Ledger, I don't know. It recalls there's too much um, too much of a shadow there. I think. I think Brolin's great, actually. I think Brolin totally pulls it off. Well, I mean, Brolin, yeah, he yeah, he did a great job. He, I was gonna say he's from West Texas. He's not, but um, but he he seems to fit in. Well, yeah. this was kind of like the Brolin Assance, right? Like he was kind of like, I don't know. Didn't this kind I mean, of put him back on the map as a this, serious this boosted guy? him big time? Yeah, he'd been yeah. like successful as a teen or whatever. Yeah, and then, Goonies, right? You know? And he was still acting, right? But he yeah. wasn't like in big name things. And then now he's Thanos, you know. Yeah, he has a couple great uh, turns in Cohen movies. Like, I think he was the only part of Hail Caesar that I really liked. Yeah, yeah, he's great in that. Yeah, uh, Shigur, they they uh, almost ca- almost had Mark Strong. You know that guy, the English guy. Mm. Yeah, it was almost him. And uh, for some, I think there was at one point where he was like on standby. Uh, he was about to do it. He was about to take the role, and then uh, Bardem finally committed or something. I, I like Mark Strong a lot, but he's he's good at like a classic villain. But Javier Bardem is just such a weirdo. Like, yeah. I, I yeah. can't really imagine anyone else doing it. Yeah, Bardem's so good in this um, because he, despite like what he's doing, he operates very slowly in these scenes. Um, he doesn't move with any kind of like speed, as if. Again, it's like someone who knows how it's all going to end, uh, that there's no like surprise or uncertainty and can kind of move at his own pace. And, and that, there's something about that sort of laconic nature with which he moves. Like, it's, it's just it's very good. I, I really like it. Yeah, I think the best instance of that and I think one of the, the scenes in the movie that is like a little haunting and sticks with me is when the guy is in the shower, the bathtub, Mm. just saying like, no, don't or whatever in Spanish. And he slowly pulls the curtain (laughs) closed uh, with his gun behind it and shoots. And it's like, I remember thinking every time it's like, he just has total confidence. The guy's not going to 
move or yeah. duck or like yeah. he doesn't rush it. He's just like, oh, you're being annoying. I have time to pull this closed and like don't have to move my like it's very um, it's a totally unique scene and, and sort of terrifying. Yeah. Well, and he always checks if his boots are clean. His boots, he man. People. Yeah. Jeez. That's the hint that the, the wife does get killed, by the way. He checks yeah. his Yeah, boots. yeah. Um, and I think they nail it with the like side characters and stuff too, or the, or the smaller parts. You know, the deputy Wendell, he's he's funny. He's funny, yeah. Um, the desk lady, the gas station guy, Stephen. Yeah, Root I feel like good. side characters in Coen Brothers movies are almost the best part. Yeah, yeah my my favorite uh, my favorite bit guy is the guy he asks about airports, who has the chicken <laughs> yeah. in his truck. That guy's just so great. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uncle Port- Ellis is a great guy. character too. Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing? You're looking at it. Mm-hmm. I deduced um, it. I think actually that's somebody- a very Coen okay. brothers line where he, Ed Tom walks in and he, uh, he said, how'd you know it was me? And he goes, uh, uh, when you walked in or I deduced it when you walked in, <laughs> such a good line. <laughs> Didn't didn't wasn't there a tweet recently that was saying the wife is supposedly sixteen? Yeah, oh, she's much was, younger in the book. Yeah, in the book, yeah. I think yeah. they make it clear he's um, 30, oh, 33 and he, she's sixteen when they get married. I think that's probably why they get along so well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and another right wing Twitter point, but yeah, there was a big rant about how that was the problem with the movie or whatever <laughs> the, the age of consent laws. Um, we already talked about cinematography, and then it's kind of obligatory. Everyone points this out, but uh, for sound and music, there's mm-hmm. great sound design, essentially no music. Yeah. That was, I guess, Ethan Cohen wanted to do that. Joel wasn't convinced, but he got bullied into it. I think it's an incredible effect, personally. I mean, it's one of those things where when I first saw it, I didn't notice it. Like, if you would have asked me right. when I left the theater, like, what do you think of the music? I wouldn't have had an answer one way or the other. It was only... Yeah like on a second viewing maybe that it was pointed out to me or I had read that somewhere and that I was like paying attention that I noticed it. And I thought, wow, this is like incredible. And what, what, what replaces the music is this kind of, uh, the wind is very like a strong presence in the movie. You hear the wind often blowing through Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what it creates again, like the, the feeling is this, to me anyway, it creates this kind of a atmosphere of absence. There's something missing and it's that, I don't know for better. I, I th- to me, it's like this sort of absence of like a God of a spirituality. It's this sort of, it, there, there's this sort of spiritual almost emptiness to this landscape and this world in which they're operating. Um, that's kind of the uh, uh, emotional or thematic effect that had on me. Um, for me, it, it the music I think contributes to this like big, this feeling of space, um, and mm-hmm. also the obviously the cinematography, these wide angle exterior shots and stuff. But I was kind of amazed looking back because I've I've watched you know a lot a lot more movies in the last year doing this podcast and stuff than I than I normally would watch, and so many movies are kind of are just long, mm-hmm. and I don't mind a long movie, but. This movie, I was amazed revisiting it that it's just two hours because it feels very big. It feels like it says a lot of stuff mm-hmm. and they get a lot done. And it's like it's shorter than almost every movie that comes out now. Yeah, Lomez, on your on your thing of sort of the absence of music and the absence of, of God, I think that's that's perfect because I think music is like mystifying mm-hmm. in a movie and the, the removal of music is is demystifying. And I think that. I remember when I saw it, you know, and I saw it in theaters, so I guess it must have been 2007, that I did, I had a feeling that I almost never have anymore, which was like, like, I don't think the movie is nihilistic, but when I left the theater, I had this feeling like, I didn't think you could make a movie that dark, Mm. um, that violent, in just like this spare, unrelenting way, and thinking it was just like, on another level from anything I'd ever seen. And it, I wouldn't have noticed it at the time, but I think probably the absence of, of music was part of creating that response in me. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool, Frazier. I know you like it when dogs die in movies. Okay, I, <laughs> that, I was especially. saving that. I was saving that, but yes, lots of dogs. I have it. I, I like that they kill dogs and animals. 
Yeah, so, pitbull pill. That, yeah, yeah, that's on my. Pitbull, yeah, and so um, definitely points to this movie for killing animals. And I was wondering how they did the hunting scene if it was like CGI. I I just yeah. rewatched it and I'm like, I it, was that CGI or did they actually? It, kill it was a deer. Okay. That's from the the Deacon's pod. He he said they just filmed it. The cloud is real. That there's this big cloud that brings this big shadow across the mm. oh, okay. the vast land. But the uh, the actual gazelle or whatever antelope my, or whatever. My uh, my uh, father in law is a huge hunter and uh, got a got the biggest pronghorn last season. Nice. So nice. Yeah. Muzzle top. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Do you know granite? Um, is is the, a dog getting shot yelp like the Wilhelm scream where they just put the same one in every movie or <laughs> the dog helm the dog helm scream <laughs> yeah cuz it's always i mean i wouldn't be shocked to learn if that's actually what dogs do if you shoot them but it seems like it's the same high pitched yeah. yelp in in every movie where a dog gets got yeah i'll look into that yeah, please do. Get back to me. I'll, yeah, I'll report on the next episode. Also, to any pet owners listening, I don't care about your pet and don't tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> now we've alienated all your audience. Yeah, it's okay. Um, well, um, should we... Uh, Degree Studies recently did a podcast on uh, Bronze Age Mindset. Mm. Um, isn't that... like? I feel like there's a lot of those themes in this movie with like the violence and kind of Llewellyn especially who is kind of like a, a, a monkey in a, in the zoo. And well, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Cause I think, I mean, you know, I don't want to speak for, for BAP or whatever, but I think that like from what I took from BAP's book, you know, Llewellyn kind of died like a beautiful death, but I don't right. think that's what the film thinks. Um, so like in, in this text i don't think i don't think it thinks that you know llewellyn's life was like worthless or or there, there's certainly much to admire in in what llewellyn did and and maybe even his end but i think the the main focus is sort of on like uh some element of tragedy that even though Llew- llewellyn is quite virtuous and quite capable is his like pride leads him to this end and so i that's why i think there are christian themes in this film that are maybe hard to reconcile with Mm. with some of that stuff but if you if you want to say more about that i'd be interested to hear it because well yeah just more so thinking about kind of uh kind of the warrior spirit and and you know i'm not a bap expert or anything but like it it did really remind me of that like you know uh what is it like you know, something, something you, you, your ancestors used to do X, Y, and Z. And you're yeah. like picking out flowers with your fiance. You wine bar, or tasteful whatever. banter, wine, wine bar. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah he's, so like, he, go ahead. He's a soldier. Yeah, no, maybe he home maybe and... Bap would say to Llewellyn, like, uh, you know, your grandfather <laughs> slit throats at the Rio Grande and you're delivering agua to a to a drug cartel guy. <laughs> you are gay. Uh, I don't know. Which was his downfall. That act of charity was his downfall. Well, yeah. but wasn't he screwed anyway because yes. of the transponder? But, yeah, he would have been screwed anyway. So I yeah. guess they well, wouldn't have had his car, you know, the serial number. So you right, can right. you can like construct this Maybe narrative they have found where the town or whatever. Yeah, he goes and visits his brother in California, or maybe that's just in the in the book. I don't know, but it um, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think the lesson actually is that Shakur is going to get him. Shakur is inescapable. Like you can only evade him for so long. He's going to get you. Um, and I wonder if. See, I don't. I don't. Yeah, in some ways, his sort of greed, I guess, is his downfall. But that's, again, that's uh, juxtaposed against, like, the gas, the gas station attendant who dies his own kind of, like, tragic death, uh, having done nothing, having demonstrated no agency, and perhaps because of those things, you know, having failed to demonstrate agency. And so the, the messaging there is a little bit ambivalent. You know, I don't know... <laughs> It's hard to, um, it's if you've run that scenario by some, you know, just by a, a 
any person, it's like you're finding drug money. It's not really someone's money. Um, yeah, it's it's very compelling to just take it and and make a go at it and see what you can make happen. Well, um, I was I thinking, I was thinking like, to myself uh, while watching this because maybe I'm I'm kind of a coward. But one thought that occurred to me is. I think if I found a suitcase full of drug money, what I would immediately think is, what's the most amount of money I can take from this bag where when they find it, they won't think it's worth it? <laughs> like if they're like, oh, 60 grand is missing, that they'll just be like, fuck it, like a courier or something. Uh, or like it fell out, you know, yeah. over there in the plane, but that they just like let it go. And yeah. I thought, you know, that amount of money is probably pretty small, but that's that's how I'd be scheming about it what's interesting though is he doesn't stumble across the briefcase he actually has to like go through some complex steps the, right. the moment of like uh, spontaneous discovery is just coming across this crime scene this shootout so the question is like what what do you do in that scenario uh most of us i don't know we call the cops and we get the hell out of there as quickly as we can there's nothing to be gained from it at all this isn't like this doesn't even have the pretense of the possibility for adventure, but Llewellyn's this kind of savvy guy who sees three, four steps out and realizes that there must be some guy who got away the ultimate ombre. And he, and then he figures out how to track down the briefcase. So it's almost like the act of discovery already implies a certain amount of competency and savvy and resourcefulness that, Anybody who finds that and and like uh, ambition, you know, like, again, this like high agency for him to even go do it. So he's already demonstrated these like personality traits. So like you and I, the cowards that we are, would never even have discovered the suitcase. We're never in that position. Uh, I don't know what the what the consequence of that is or what the implications there are, but there's something there, I think. Yeah. And and. Cool, Fraser. The the thing that is Bappian, I think, is that I don't think Llewellyn is greedy. I actually think he just wants an opportunity yeah, right. for his for his various competencies to have high stakes for like his utility to have an impact like, in the almost world. Almost like violence yeah. gives him purpose or something, you know? Yeah, and like a, a contest against you know very capable foes and the elements. And like I I do think the movie. The movie is is definitely not saying like, oh, he's just a dumbass and there's nothing beautiful in in what he's doing. Like it's it's admiring of his capacity and his inclination. It just ultimately, you know, finds it like tragic and that, you know, no matter how competent or capable you are, you can't sort of take on the evil forces in the world. But yeah. But yeah. yeah. And I think a big part of this movie actually is that self-insertion. So the 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 um what would you do if you found a briefcase, you know, yeah. and nobody was around, right? <laughs> well, but then the other big one is the coin flip, right? What would you do if he told you to flip, to pick a heads or tails? And, and yeah, so tails I think never that, fails, guys. So that would be, that would be simple. <laughs> yeah, I think those scenes are like, I think that's part of the staying power of this movie, honestly, is it gives the viewer this easy way into like, Wow, what would I do if I were in that situation? Which yeah. kind of makes it stick with you a little longer. So I had um, I had a, a Lou Ellen moment, kind of. I uh, I go out walking at night. I like to go these long walks, and uh, I was I was cutting through this like apartment building, like a you know, well anyway, and uh, there's this pouch on the ground. And it's the kind of pouch like I used to work in a bank, and it's these like kind of pleather, fake leather mm -hmm. like pouches. And it's the kind of things that people would bring in checks and cash in. So mm -hmm. I was like, and it's just on the ground and it, it was full and I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm looking around and I'm like, do I pick this up? Like, uh, it's not a particularly nice area. Like is someone watching me right now. Some is someone looking for this. Yeah, You were with your friend, Mizzy. He was holding <laughs> the camera. Yeah. I was probably on a, this is probably a TikTok. Yeah. But, uh, but so anyway, I do pick it up. And unfortunately I open it up and it's just like a hygiene kit. It's just like band-aids <laughs> and uh, toothbrushes and stuff like that. That's happened to me too. I've actually found a satchel just like that, but full of money. 
And, um, oh, man. yeah, yeah. And it, I, I was in grad school at the time and, you know, I don't know, I would imagine it was, the, it, it's the same thing that most everyone would do, which is, uh, where I found it was in front of this bank, but it was like a Sunday. And so I told the bank I had found it and, uh, they were able to locate this guy who was doing deposits for this like small company he worked at. And he was like this intern that had like dropped the like weeks you know, like, uh, front. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like cashier receipts. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it was like a couple grand and he, and he just came by my apartment and picked it up and that was it. And <laughs> it, it's like, it, you know, this isn't some like great act of like moral courage or something, you know, but that's a couple grand. It's totally different when you're staring at your future 2.4 million, I think is the number they use in the in the book or in the movie. Yeah. And in the book, uh, Llewellyn regards this satchel. He says something to the effect that this was the rest of my life represented in a, in a, in a suitcase or in a satchel. And it, at that scale, the sort of moral mechanics change, the moral calculus changes and also the context in which it's found. I mean, again, this is like, Mexican drug dealers. This is like ill-gotten gain. So there's something totally sort of morally sort of uh, complicated about it and unclear about it. I don't know what I'd do in that situation. I yeah, probably, this- I would have never have found it in the first place. Cause again, I would have walked away from the crime scene and like peed my pants and gone back and told the, <laughs> you know, you know, cops yeah. about it. I, this is a little bit different, but I like telling the story just cause it's so odd. But, uh, I did like a year and a half of, of grad school at the American University of Beirut. And because mm. it's uh, like backward and retarded, uh, you got <laughs> your loan disbursements all in cash once a year. So this one time in Beirut, I had to go to a bank six blocks from the registrar and they gave me 25000 U.S. American oh, dollars, which I put in a Jansport backpack <laughs> and then walked six blocks across Beirut to hand it to, you know, the HR lady at uh, the financial aid office. And it was just like one of the most stressful things I've ever <laughs> done in my life. And, you know, of course, like normal people at the bank were watching me load up my backpack and were like, what the hell is going on here? And I was like, I'm just going to get jacked like immediately. <laughs> but I mean, it all worked out. But yeah, even just, I guess the, the way I would relate this back is just even being in the presence of that amount of money in cash gave me like an eerie and unsettled feeling. Yeah. That, that could be a movie. That's the start of a movie. Mm-hmm. Six yeah. blocks, me and yeah. most deaf. <laughs> Six blocks, one backpack. <laughs> um, are there any black people in this movie? Oh, the guy who picks him up hitchhiking. So, yeah, interestingly, the one black character is totally noble. <laughs> <laughs> well, in like 1980s rural West Texas, yeah. what would be the odds of just kind of randomly running into a black guy? I mean, I don't know. That's an open question. Not a ton, but yeah. Oh, this one, I, I got to mention this one. It's like the most basic sort of like production note, but uh in case anyone listening hasn't heard this part. So There Will Be Blood was filming in the same vicinity at the same time. Oh, wow. And No Country actually had to stop one day and, and you know, cancel shooting because they were testing out the pyrotechnics for those big, um, that big fire scene in, in uh, There Will Be Blood. And it created too much smoke in the background, so they had to cancel. Mm. That's funny. Yeah, I don't know if you want to get into it, Granite, but I do think it was interesting at the time, the sort of fandoms of those two movies. And like, Mm -hmm. I remember there sort of being like a little bit of a tit for tat of like certain kinds of pretentious people being like, no country is fake, like there will be (laughs) blood is so much better and vice versa. And I liked both movies, but I was definitely in the camp of like, there will be blood is like a little foofy and stylized and over the top. And like, you know, give me this, give me this Cormac McCarthy realness. But I don't know if either of, or if any of you guys recall sort of like the, 
the conflict between film people over those two films. Now, I remember that, and I was in the exact same camp. I liked them both, but No Country was sort of like the most like powerful thing I had seen in my. That was like a very cinema like cinema awakening for me. I was like, whoa, you can mm -hmm. you can make a movie like this. Um, so that one was that was more important to me. I don't, I don't know. I like I said, I didn't see them because I was in Paraguay, but. Uh, <laughs> I saw them both actually within the last year and I I'm probably on the, the froofy uh, cinematic uh, there will be blood camp. I don't know. Hmm. There's more of Dune in there will be blood. So this <laughs> yeah. Doesn't, this doesn't surprise me. Cool. Well, I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a sucker for uh, uh, cinematography in general, which they're both great, but I would say the other one's a little bit more, uh, I don't know. I, I think, sake. I mean, for me, uh, I think No Country for Old Men is a, a much better movie. Um, it's a more enjoyable sort of experience watching. It's much more rewatchable. Sure. I like both uh, as well. And Daniel Day-Lewis is pretty incredible. I mean, well, more than pretty incredible. He, he's and what like about a Paul Dano? Paul Dano, you know, a little over the top for my taste, but okay, fine. Um <laughs> What, what's so great about No Country, though, and I think this was uh, – Degree was touching on this earlier, um, just how sort of despite it being you know two hours or right at the two-hour mark, it just – it packs so much into it. There's no like loose scenes. Everything – and this is true of all Coen Brothers movie. They're very – not all, most. Uh, they're very tight. And every yeah. scene there, – there isn't like – you know, PTA – does more of just setting up a kind of premise and letting it's sort of indulging the actors and, and Daniel day Lewis, of course, and just letting them kind of be on screen right. and it, really it's definitely perform. more loosey goosey. Yeah. It's just, it's just like perform for us, you know, and it's more theatrical in some ways. I think I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I tire of that a little bit or anyway, it doesn't have, it's not as last. It doesn't have as lasting of value. The narrative of this is just so sharp. And the acting is so good and the script is so tight. It's like every single word um, has a purpose or delivers something interesting. Uh, to me, it's it's pretty much flawless. And this, no country, might, that is. this might sound more critical than I mean it to, but I think uh, no country has sort of like the human confronting the inhuman mm. and in there will be blood. It's all inhuman. Mm. Like it's, there's not that much to me that's recognizable. Uh, like I'm sure there are humans like Daniel Plainview or whatever, but like, it's not, uh, it's not my experience of life. Whereas, you know, Llewellyn might be sort of more larger than life than men I know like that, or, mm -hmm. or the sheriff might be the same, but they're recognizable to me as, as people from the world. Mm -hmm. And I think the Coen brothers are like a little more human than, than PTA mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. It's definitely more like surreal. The uh, there there will be blood, and then this is more like hyper real or something like that. And then um, assassination of Jesse James was the same year, I believe. And uh, so there's those three pretty prominent like westerns, or or kind of vaguely mm -hmm. western movies. Um, ushered in quite a quite a few more westerns. So we had a decent run of about ten years where there was like the you know the, the, I guess they call them the new westerns or mm -hmm. whatever, but. Uh, but I liked quite a lot of those, so grateful for that. Yeah, including Coen Brothers then went on to make True Grit, which was incredible too. I thought that movie was really yeah. good. They definitely found something in this kind of like scenery and through these character types that lends itself well to their, yeah, kind of obsession with sort of violence and the themes that they touch on. Um, yeah, and I guess I'm, I'm not even like... Uh, I, I guess I'm going back to the beginning of like, is this uh, based or, or right wing or whatever, but I do sort of feel like at a certain point, like you just have to say that if you make a cowboy movie or you make a Western and you're not like deconstructing, like you just have characters that are like brave because they're conquering yeah. the frontier. In other words, if you're not doing a social justice deconstruction of a western story Django but you're Jane. invoking yeah if you're, you're invoking like the classical presentation like i don't know how you can view that as anything other than reactionary like in the context yeah. of uh contemporary hollywood so well um 
this might be too big of a question for this late in the podcast. And so cut me off if it's wrong, granted. But uh, we're, we got some smart guys here and we're, we're not libtards and uh, <laughs> we like good art, you know? Is, is it just that like literary criticism is dominated by leftists yeah. or is it um, like, is there actually a, a lack of, of, of art that from a reactionary or right wing perspective or whatever? No, it's, it, I mean, uh, my own view is that it's very clearly the latter, the, the kinds of institutions that produce criticism are the exact same ones that, you know, deliver us the news and all our other media and it all works right. according to the same logic and incentive structures. And it promotes exactly the same kind of people from exactly the same kind of places. And, uh, you know, they, they, even, what they do then is they also like sort of will go back and retroactively apply this kind of like leftist lens to older stories that were initially presumed to have a sort of more conservative or right leaning, um, interpretation or set of themes. I mean, what, what it might be fair to say is that the artists themselves may genuinely have, at least as an electoral matter, um, like liberal beliefs. So like, again, I have no doubt that at least in the Cohen, Cohen brothers case, although I don't know this for sure, but, uh, I'm guessing they're like libs. Um, I'm guessing they like, yeah, vote. there's no H in the name, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one of them, uh, uh, it, anyway, it doesn't matter. And, and Cormac McCarthy, probably his politics are as illegible as his uh, sort of religious beliefs. You know, it's always, when it comes to good artists, it's always more complicated than any kind of like superficial label you might apply right. to them. But the art itself, the stories, at least as I define what it means to be right wing, and of course this is subject to uh, different interpretations, is like, it's just holding up this kind of unflinchingly honest mirror to the world and being very clear headed and honest about what it's reflecting back to us about ourselves, about our pathologies, about our limitations, etc. And so when I look at this movie or these movies that we're talking about, this, this good art that we're talking about, what makes them good, what makes them so salient is the fact that when we look at them as a mirror on our world, there is this verisimilitude. What we see is something we recognize as being true. And in that sense, in my definition of them being quote unquote right wing art, uh, it qualifies. Yeah, yeah, I think that you're generally right that most great artists are politically illegible. But when I go down as a famous author, I will be a page will say he was a MAGA guy and yeah. people will just have to uh, accept it. But yeah, I think the, I think you're, you're totally right. Lomas that the, the culture industry just, it's to no one's benefit, including the directors to explore why a film might be right wing. I think yeah. that the interesting question is when things read as right wing like, I think one interesting in inflection point that happens is when the culture industry decides, okay, this is so transparently right wing that we have to publicly turn on it yeah. versus when they say, let's try to recover like left wing themes. And I think in the instance of this movie, the decision was made for them because the, the power of the artistry is just undeniable. And so I think when something is so clearly good, yeah. and maybe also happens to be right wing, they have to just say, well, let's just celebrate it and, you know, glean from it what we can thematically for our ends. But, you know, there are there are instances, I think, where they they also will like turn on a film that they perceive to be reactionary. But I don't know how they make those calculations. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And I guess from from my s perspective, I kind of feel like right wing guys or our guys are so like eager to surrender when like a piece of art comes out and they're like, Oh, there was a lesbian character. Oh, I guess it's for libtards only now. Yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> like they're so willing to just say, okay, there's no value in this because some superficial aspect of the, the film doesn't fit in with their spe specific values. I think that was true with like Noah, which we talked about on a previous episode where like, oh, no, it's they're so like, good. Oh, climate change, Noah. Like uh, we no. hate it, you know, but like there's so much good stuff in there that yeah. like 
you would just miss out if you just took that service level rating that was like advertised by like, you know, the media. And so no, you're so like, right. Cool and I, Frazier, you're so right. Yeah. I feel like we just need to like own art more. And like, mm-hmm. even if it is made by total libtards, we could still do our, Hey, this is the based reading of, of Barbie that's coming up, you know? <laughs> no, right. And you know, just from being on Twitter that like, there is a crypto like a crypto right wing canon. Yeah. And some of it is like actually uh-huh. right wing and some of it is these more adventurous or interpretive takes on, you know, canonical art that maybe isn't even that right wing, but there's still value in in maybe pretending or, or projecting it is. But yeah, I I do think that sort of um I mean I've made this argument I think on Granite's podcast before, but I think that the art world is in like a bit of a pickle because I think that something that would be recognized as say like good dialogue is inevitably, for instance, going to have to capture like things that are true between men and women. Yeah. And you know, you, you could take something that's like even totally like feminized and libtarded and I wouldn't defend like sex in the city, but there are still like moments in that show of like accidental transparency about, the way men and women talk about each other and like relate to one another. And I think the show can only be as popular as it was because it sometimes traffics in what are essentially like reactionary understandings of the world. And I think that's present in like all popular art and calling it out and acknowledging it is really, really important. Yeah, I've made a thread about uh, this before with regards to uh, Girls, you know, Lena Dunham's HBO series Right, Girls, a perfect example, yeah. Which to me is the perfect example of like clearly reactionary art that is um, created by accident by like an ultra shit lib um, because she can't help herself from just telling the truth. So just by observing this world in which she found herself, which is, you know, hipster era, Obama era, like New York city. uh, And what it, what it was like to live in that world as a young person, sort of looking for a partner and just being used and abused and, you know, going through all these guys and the completely perverse, like sexual dynamics uh, between men and women at the time is exactly the same uh, critique that like right wingers make about uh, male and female, like like female uh, liberation, you know, uh, feminine liberation, and whatever wave of feminism we're on, and what ha- what it has wrought on both men and women alike. And so, yeah, again, it's just does this art, does this piece of art, uh, say something true about our world? And to the degree to which it's it's saying something true, sort of unashamedly true. Um, then it, again, it's sort of inevitably going to have this right wing kind of texture to it. Yeah, that's <clears throat> been something we come back to quite a lot on this uh, on this show. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely in favor of claiming or at least pointing these things out. Uh, you know, and then a lot of a lot of stories to me, kind of there's there's just narrative. Um, there's just narrative things where it only certain stories only really work if they um, are endorsing something that that we that we like or we believe, um, you know, things about like honor or or mm-hmm. or agency or, you or know, strength, the truth or yeah, or strength, yeah, or or ne- necessity of violence when it's necessary. And, yeah, yeah, and I'll I'll just interrupt to say, Granite, I think your your Noah podcast, which I know Cool Frazier was also on with with Bennett. Uh, was like a great example of what we're talking. Like, I think you guys did an excellent job because I'd seen that movie and I'd liked it, but I hadn't thought deeply and you guys pulling out all the like religious meaning and presentation of family and responsibility. Like it was a, it was a really good instance of exactly what we're talking about. So I, you know, I always enjoy this podcast, but I thought that was an exceptional episode and anyone listening to this should go check that out. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I, that one um, got you know quite a lot of listens. But yeah, anyone who hasn't heard it, I'd love for them to to check it out. Um, I think I'll wrap it up there. There's one more thing. It's totally random, but uh, I didn't want to didn't want to leave it out. So at one point in the film, Ed Tom is I think it's one of his narrations. He's saying, 
that uh, that I think it was a kid who killed a judge or something like that, mm-hmm. or, or someone someone killed a judge. Well, it's kind of strange because you know Woody Harrelson's dad in real life was a hitman and he he killed a judge in in West Texas. Oh, so yeah. I remember, I don't know if it was you who told me that, but someone told me that about Woody Harrelson's dad recently, and I read the Wikipedia, and it was it was crazy. Yeah, he, he, uh, his dad died in 2007 in, uh, in, in uh, 80, what is it, Florence, Supermax Florence or whatever, uh-huh. same place where uh, Kaczynski is and, every, and a bunch of other notable <laughs> prisoners. That's wild. I actually didn't shout know out, that about Harrelson. Shout out to Kaczynski. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, have <laughs> you guys done it? Have you guys done a natural born killers uh episode? No, no, we haven't. Have I haven't seen, seen that? that since I haven't seen that for at least twenty years. It's kind of a mess in the way that Oliver Stone movies are a mess, but uh it might be interesting to revisit. And actually, now that you mentioned that thing about Woody Harrelson's dad, which I had no idea about, it will it might be interesting to rewatch that movie. Uh, yeah, his dad that was... would be that would be great fodder for you, Granite, because I think that movie uh, and I fall on one side of this, but that movie really brings out in people like, is this like a disgusting indulgence in uh-huh. what America has become? Or is it like a warning? And I think as Lomez says, because it's a mess, you can really <laughs> mount evidence yeah. for both arguments. Yeah. And so people have really strong. Th- I, I kind of hate it, but yeah, uh, I it's, it's certainly <laughs> it's certainly interesting. Well, Oliver Stone, I mean, it, it's kind of perfect. uh like characterization of his of his career and personality and and like that's true of like pretty much everything he does is this right or left wing i have no idea yeah yeah he's he's um he's left wing but he also yeah doesn't he doesn't he openly say that cia got kennedy or something yeah yeah and he likes putin he's just He's he's a he's a mixed up young young man. <laughs> Sensitive young man, yeah. Yeah. He fell okay. into the wrong YouTube algorithm. Yeah, yeah, he got groomed at the age of like sixty five. That's true. Has, has, someone videos. needs to look in yeah, I was gonna say somebody <laughs> needs to look into if Oliver Stone had early copies of Twelve Rules for Life. <laughs> yeah. That led to his uh... Um all right, I'm gonna wrap it up there, guys. Thanks oh, wait. for joining. Oh wait, wait, wait! wait, wait. Um, oh, if we were to recast the movie again today, I would cast the wife as Zazie Beats. Oh, you had, to, <laughs> you had cool Fraser has to do a Zazie Beats reference. Sorry, I just okay. didn't get my Zazie Beats reference in. You could have thrown it in when I asked if there was any black people. I know, I know, I missed, I dropped the ball on it. Sorry, I don't know. Cool Fraser, you you have you have two running bits, uh, and I support one of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to wrap it up there. Yeah, this is great. Thanks a lot for having me on, guys. I really enjoyed this. Oh, thanks for joining.